Welcome to The Well, I'm Anson Mount. I am Brandon Edgens. And uh, you recently heard an episode that we brought to you of The Drop, where we talked about uh, the movie that we discovered recently, Out of Darkness. And uh, right after we finished recording, we were excited to hear that we'd, we'd gotten a call back from the representatives of its its creator, Andrew Cumming. And uh, so we thought we'd jump back on and, and ask all the questions that we wanted to ask and uh, bring you along with for the ride. So, Andrew, welcome to The Well. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah. And uh, Brandon, you wanted to, to kick things off? I'm going to just jump straight into why of all the things to make your first feature something with so many uh, let's just say challenges like for example pitching something like this it's in an, uh, an unknown language um, what what made you what made you decided that this was going to be your first feature um, I didn't to begin with um, I thought I might make this in 20 years if I ever got any sort of influence you know, maybe one day I'd make a big studio movie that would make lots of money and they might say, hey, what do you want to do? And I thought, I'll make, I'll do this. So the the, the origins of it, um, I, I saw a documentary on the BBC here in the UK just as I was finishing film school and it was about early modern humans travelling into Western Europe for the first time um, and thought, oh, what a, that would be a really interesting time period to make a movie about. But there was no story. I just thought, wow, I've never seen that done at that at that time. I wasn't aware of things like Quest for Fire and Plan of the Cave Bear, etc. Um, and then I read William Golding's follow-up to Lord of the Flies, a book called The Inheritors, which is about a family of Neanderthals traveling back to their summer hunting grounds after a pretty tough winter. And they encounter some strange two-legged creature homo sapiens uh and i won't i won't say any more than that because you should go and read the book it's incredible and i finished this book and said okay I'm, i'll make that um this is this now i understand why i'm interested in this time period i'm on because the book is this really fresh take on humanity um and our brutality and what we do things we understand and how we amass power and try to destroy things. Um, so yeah, I thought, well, one day I'll make The Inheritors. And then I met the, the film's producer, Oliver Kastman. And, you know, it was a general meeting. We we're just discussing ideas. And he said, oh, I've got this idea for a horror movie about early modern humans. And I said, well, okay, wow, this is, you know, this is the, this is the planets aligning because you've just described the time period and the kind of movie I would like to make. And I, I told him about the inheritors, but I said, you know, this is a long-term thing. This is my, this is my goal. And he said, but why not, why not do it as a first feature? Why do you have to play safe? So I think it was partly me. It was partly just being interested in that time period and, and, and the, the message that it could convey. It was a good vehicle to talk about things I wanted to talk about with the rise of, um, Brexit in the UK and, and Trump in the States. There was a, a period of them and them versus us that was felt really pronounced at the time. Um, so yeah, he 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 said, let's let's do this for your debut um, rather than wait twenty years and make it. Um, so it's just it was nice to have the permission somebody to say it's okay to be ambitious and and take a big swing. Um, so that was the beginning of it. That was that was it. Well, first of all, that's a great producer uh but i sure. uh, i also um you know you'll be, i think you'll be happy to hear that after i saw the film i actually told my wife in the car on the way back to the hotel i said i think there might have been a version of this story that was from the neanderthals point of view but it would mm -hmm. be hard to mm -hmm. preserve the twist at the end if if it began that way and and so yeah. Yeah. But th yeah. So, so I can totally, I can totally see that. Because I, it's something that I thought about as well as, you know, because occasionally you get asked, oh, is there a sequel? And you go, and I, you know, sort of semi joking say, you could kind of do what Clint Eastwood did with Flags of Our Fathers, right? And you could do the Iojima version where you, you know, look at it from the, the other people's point of view. But um, yeah, that probably wouldn't work in terms of, you know, the costume and stuff. So, but no, it's, it's definitely, 
um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to say too much about the Inheritors. It's a it's a truly great book, and I think I think it might be better than Lord of the Flies personally. And I love that that novel. Um, it means a lot to me. So I, I would just encourage you guys to 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 root it out if you haven't heard about it or read it already. It's a really fascinating uh, piece of work. Well, this could be. Uh... You know, why stop there? This could be the beginning of an entire uh, Paleolithic cinematic universe. This just could go on and on and on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Again, we've spoken about this, and you know, mm -hmm. it would be it would be fun to it'd be fun to do something. You, you know, um, with the Le with Leone's um, Once Upon a Time in the West. You know how um, Charles Bronson's playing the harmonica, and those three guys turn up on the platform. Do you know originally he wanted that to be um, Clint Eastwood, Lee Van Cleef, and, um, oh God, what's his name? Eli Wallach? Yes, Eli Wallach. He wanted it to be those three guys and Charles Bronson would shoot them all. <laughs> and that and that was going to be right. Okay, Spaghetti Western, you know, that period is over. So I kind of, again, semi-joking thought, oh yeah, what if we did something with the people that survive the end of this movie and we just kill them off in the first 10 seconds, and then you have a time lapse of like dirt, you know, building up over their bones over thousands of years, and then you, you know, you just jump forward five, ten thousand years, and and see where you're at. So yeah, no, these are all, these are all valid points. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was it about specifically? I mean, you said it was an interesting story, and it is, but lots of things are interesting stories. I mean, what <laughs> specifically about prehistory, you know, grabs your attention? I think it's partly the fascination with it from a, just from the the point of view of survival, the, the the daily grind of having to catch your food and cook it and make your clothes from scratch and not knowing if you step around that corner that you might fall off the edge of the world and why are there stars and why is there a moon and you know just these concepts that we take for granted and just how people lived in that time period and so that was just fascinating and then you know then you ask questions like well did they talk and and, and you know what did they wear and did they fashion jewelry and just what was life like um and then of course like i mentioned you know we were because myself and oliver we um we were fans of a spec script that ruth greenberg the writer had written and her, her tone of voice was very muscular very visually driven she really wanted to tell stories that had um, that had genre trappings and that were about violence, and so this all felt like it fitted. And we, we took the idea to her, um, and she jumped on it because there were things she wanted to say as well, being a woman and wanting to see more um, films that spoke about violence perpetrated by women and towards women. And um, so, you know, the, the three of us really went on that journey together. And like I say, we were, we were all this all coalesced at a time when Brexit was happening in the UK and there was a lot of, um, a lot of really horrible rhetoric uh, and division. And similarly in the States, the, the divisions that Trump stoked um, to, 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 you know, to further his campaign, which, and there was a lot of populist movements starting to pop up in, in Europe as well. So there was, it was just a time when there was a lot of anger and fear and mistrust and blaming other people for the problems we have. So it just felt like really rich territory to talk about what was going on, but not in a, not head on, you know, to do it through a horror movie, to do it through a, a, a certain, a different time period, but you're talking about universal truths. And I, so again, when I pitched the movie, when we were looking for financing, I'd say, you know, there'll be a subtitle at the beginning that says this is set 45,000 years ago, but what if that subtitle wasn't there? And actually this was some post-apocalyptic future 45,000 mm. years from now. And this idea of do we change, you know, do we, as a species, is this just what we're designed to do? That we, that humans have survived because of our inhumanity. And that's the reason we're at the top of the food chain. And can, or can we break the cycle? Um, you know, cause you don't have to be an avid historian to look back through even recent history and see that we we have a track record for this kind of behaviour, um, and it's happening right now in you know various flashpoints around the world. I don't have to you know underline that. So um, all those things together, between the thematic resonance, the time periods, and how that could help us explore that, 
and then obviously then the 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 the, the structure you have with a horror movie where terrible things happen to people and in very exciting ways just felt like a really fresh cool idea and ultimately i thought yeah i would pay to see that at the cinema if it was done well um and then and that's it you know those if you're ticking all those boxes let's let's try it and see what happens i I was i was curious um it's such a first of all it once the pieces started falling into place uh I was like, oh my God, this is such a brilliant idea for a movie. I can't believe I didn't think of it. Um, but then I thought, wow, how in the world did he pitch that to the backers? <laughs> like, how do you go in and like say and say, I've got this movie and it's about some people 45,000 years ago wearing animal skins and there's no sets and there's something running around and it's killing them and we're just going to shoot in the highlands. Like, what? how do you... I mean, did you pitch this as the original Scottish story or how did you do that? Yeah, well, I mean, again, it goes back to having a great producer. I mean, Oliver really championed this movie early on. Um, and it was also, it's, it's, sometimes it's a case of good timing. You know, he, he made another movie with a filmmaker called Rose Glass called St. Maud's, which was a, gr- a great British debut. Um, and so he, there was a, he had a certain clout now as having made a feature that had done really well, um, that people, you know, there were doors opening that maybe weren't opened before because they wanted to see what else he had on his slate, right? So I kind of, Thank God that Saint Maud did so well, um, but you know, you, you you yeah, you go in and you, it's exactly like you say. It's you know, there's a, there's a, there's at least five reasons not to make this movie. It's a debut. It's period. It's in a made up language. It has a discovery cast, and you know, and the last one obviously is the COVID of it all because we shot during you know once in a generation global pandemic. So there's five good reasons for them to close the door in your face. But I think. You know, the, the, the horror landscape has changed, um, I think, as well. Again, we were starting to talk about the idea that, that a trailer for this little horror film called The Witch dropped. And we and I, we and Oliver and I watched this and went, oh, okay, Robert Eggers has kind of blown the doors off because he proved you could make a genre movie in a certain time period and really lean into the stylings and the mannerisms and the, the, the voice of that period and it be taken seriously and done with sincerity, it can work. So suddenly that 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 pitch didn't seem so crazy. Um, and then, you know, and then you, you, you hear no's. Some people were interested and then they said, no, it's not for us. And, um, and then we found the right people to go with. But then again, you know, you just, it's all about timing sometimes. And we were, we were struggling to find that last little bit of money to get the film made and COVID happened and the whole industry shut down. And then, you know, when, when, it, when people were trying to get back to work and trying to get the industry back on its feet in the UK, suddenly six discovery cast up a mountain in Scotland was about the only thing you could make if you did it safely. So, you know, it, it's partly about the passion and the idea and how you pitch it. And, you know, we did a look book and we, you know, compiled a soundtrack and I did a sizzle reel, you know, all those usual things you hear about, but it's also about just being at the right place in the right time. And, and that's, that's obviously a harder thing to manage because you can't control that, but it, it certainly all of that together helped hugely. Yeah. It looked to me that uh, the location was a, uh, about as socially distanced as you could be uh, at, a, at a time at, the, at that particular time. Um, I just want to echo what Anson said when the film first started and it started to I started realizing what was happening I had the same thought uh why didn't somebody do this before because this is this is drama uh stripped down to its to its roots to its actual origins you know it, it the, you don't get any more dramatic than life and death and I just want to congratulate you on uh sneaking how how the message of that film really sneaks up, and because you think you're on it for a horror film ride, you know, spills and thrills and chills, and so it, it it you did a great job of sneaking in the 
I don't like to call it the message, but you, clearly it was on your mind and part oh, of sure. the inspiration. And yeah. it, you're so bought into that world already. It just, I thought it was, I thought it was beautifully done. Thank you, thank you. That means a lot. Yeah, I mean that that was the intent. I, I'll drop spoilers, but that that meeting between Homo sapien and Neanderthal was the whole reason to make the movie because that was the sliding door moment for both species. Now, it maybe didn't go down the way that we portray it, right? Because I think every Caucasian in Western Europe has at least 4% Neanderthal DNA in them. So, you know, we were, we may have been arguing over territory, but we were also, you know, having candlelit dinners around the fire. I mean, there was certainly, you know, we were, there was interspecies mingling happening. Mm -hmm. But also Neanderthals had been in Western Europe for about 300,000 years until we came along and then within 18,000 years, they were gone. So that was when we became the apex, you know, the the, the the top of the pyramid. And I just, again, it goes back to that BBC documentary, Reading the Inheritors, everything was leading to that moment. So, yeah, I mean, I know some people who paid to go and see a monster movie probably go, oh, I feel a little bit shortchanged, but that is the thing that I found so exciting about it is, yeah, I'm going to lead you down this way for two thirds and now you're watching a different movie where actually, you know, you're now watching this young woman who's become this genocidal maniac because she's worried that she won't live to see another day. So, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that worked for you. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, the Discovery cast, let's talk about the cast for a minute. How did you, how did that search begin? I'm sure it began like it normally begins. But uh, I guess what were you looking for? And I'll just say something about uh, about your cast. They were fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, um, it was from the beginning because, you know, we have, a, we have a, a paleolithic expert who advised us. Of course, when we are grilling him about the time period, the first thing we asked is, okay, what did we look like? And he said, well, you know, we don't know for certain, but new evidence is pointing us in the direction that we were dark skins. You know, and if you think about our migration out of West Africa 60,000 years ago, um, as we move further north over thousands of years, our skin would start to lighten because we're, you know, moving in a colder climate. So we don't need that um, that defense anymore from the from the hot sun. Um, but at the same time, this I, I feel uncomfortable using this term, but it's the best way to describe it is there's that the scientists think that the so-called white gene didn't come into Western Europe until about 10,000 years ago, around the time of the agricultural revolution, you know, when we started having farms and growing crops. So, okay, we weren't black, we weren't white. So, you know, it's okay. So what's, what is the middle ground? What is the, what is the thing that, and, and so that was when myself, Oliver, Ruth and Heather Baston, our casting director decided, okay, our, our, our call is for mixed heritage mixed race actors, actors that identify in that bracket. Because what I was looking for as well was cohesion. We needed to believe that this group of people had moved around together, not only in their lifetime, but in their ancestors' lifetimes, okay? So everybody had to have a particular, a certain look. And that just fit, and, and going for identifying mixed race, mixed heritage actors, felt like the best way of hitting all those, those, those points. So yeah, that was the casting call. And then, you know, you go about it the same way as you do all the time now, it's self-tapes. You, you know, Heather went through a lot of self-tapes. Um, and first of all, we gave them the script in English. And then the people we liked, we gave them the script with the, the constructed language, Tola. And then the people that did the Tola well, they came into the room and I set up an obstacle course, you know, flipped a table, a desk, gave them a broom handle to be a spear because I wanted to see how they would move. Fully. The last thing you want to do is get on set with an actor and find out they've got a weird run or something. You know, it's just then it's uh, then it's hell to try and shoot around that. So, um, yeah, we um, and then we workshop scenes and then it was just. It's like trying to put together the world's greatest pop group, right? You've, you've got to have, you've got your archetypes, you've got your characters, so you're just trying to put together, I believe, you know, these guys would be brothers. I believe this would be the son. Um, and, you know, and then especially with the character of Bea, played, played with such ferocity by Safia Oakley-Green in her first movie when she was 19 years old, um, you're looking for someone who has a childlike aura about them. 
but then can also become a, a warrior and can become an, an agent of death. So um, you're looking for someone that has a physicality, but also can act. And, you know, it's, yeah, so you, you know, it's just, you do it the normal way, but the, the parameters were kind of set quite early on that we weren't going to open it up to a very wide field, had to be quite a narrow, but very deep trawl. Wow, that was her first movie? Yes, sir. Yes, she'd done two short films before that. But yeah, number one on the call sheet and yeah, constructed language. She won a British Independent Film Awards um, a while back, just you know, when, as the film was going through the festival run for Best Newcomer. And we couldn't believe it. We thought, no, what, how did she, she texts me and said, I can't believe I won. I can't believe I won. I'm like, honey, <laughs> you, you were 19. You were carrying a movie in a made up language that was so physical during COVID. Like, yeah, you deserve this. Like you really, you, you knocked it out of the park. So um, yeah, no, that was very gratifying for all of us because it was a big, it was a lot to ask of her, a lot to ask that she carry this movie. Uh, yeah. Did, uh, when it came to production, I don't know. How, how did it look as challenging to be out there filming in that landscape as it looked? Yes, yes. It's the short. It's the short answer. <laughs> that was a yeah. very big head nod. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, you 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 walk into this quite naively. You go, oh, yeah, prehistoric horror movie. This will be cool. And then, and even when we did the Rekis and scouting locations, it was always really lovely and sunny. And we thought, yeah, of course we'll film on this hillside, and it'll be beautiful. And then the Scottish winter hits and um, yeah, it's tough. You know, you, you're, you're being buffeted by winds up to 40 miles an hour and you know, everything that comes with that rain and hail and snow and, um, and you know, once you're wet, you're soaked and that's you for the day. So you just have to grin and bear it. I mean, it was, it was easier for the crew because we have waterproofs. But for the cast who are in furs, I mean, once that stuff's wet, it's heavy. You're adding an extra stone and weight onto your day. And, and uh, can you run faster? The, the, you know, that take wasn't fast enough. Can you just, you know, um, over very uneven ground. So even, you know, trying to put down a dolly and track was impossible. And um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was hard. It was physically demanding, obviously mentally exhausting because you're trying to make this movie um, and keep everybody on the, on the right path. Um, so yeah, but, but also the good thing about being out there is you could see the weather coming. So you said, okay, I think we've got about five minutes to try and get this shot. And then we'll just pull up our hoods, turn our backs, let it blow over. And then we'll go again. So yeah, you just, and the other thing is, you know, you watch a lot of movies now and there's this great invention called the volume, which a lot of these franchises are using to, to create far off worlds, but there's something very artificial about it, very synthetic about it. You can just tell these people are not in the desert. Um, but, you know, one of my favorite filmmakers is uh, Akira Kurosawa and the way he uses the elements, you can't fake it. You know, when you're out there and the rain is coming in horizontally and your actress or your actor are just soaked through and the, the rain is beating on their skin and pouring off them and their furs are just sodden and they're sweaty and they're out of breath and they're covered in mud. You just, that's the movie. That's what it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be this visceral, authentic, dirt under the fingernails experience for them and for the audience. So I always felt, you know, as a... The director has a very difficult job because on the one hand, you need to look after everybody's well-being, both physically and mentally. But on the other hand, you're looking through this monitor and saying, do I believe it? Hmm. And, you know, and sometimes you have to push people um, and, and encourage people and cajole people. Um, so, you know, it was difficult for me to, on the other hand, to care deeply about these people and the effort they were putting in, but also saying, I need one more take, guys. I need you to run faster up that hill. It's just it's hard. Well, how were they during all this? While you while they were wet and tired and weighed down with wet furs, how did they react to being asked to run faster? I think I think everybody knew it was going to be a challenge. We didn't pull any punches when we pitched this movie. You know, it was going to be tough um, for a lot of reasons. You know, the COVID of it all because you know we we created a bubble for six weeks so nobody could see their family. Um, that's very difficult. Um, and, uh, but, you know, so th there was that side to it, but just purely every day, physically, mentally, learning this language. Um, 
um, you know, the, everybody was exhausted. But again, you cannot, you cannot fake that. And I think they all bought into it. They were all, they saw how committed I was, how committed Oliver was, Ruth, you know, the, all the heads of the department. And I think once you're all standing out there and you've got the costume on and the cameras are rolling, um, everybody just wanted to do their best. And yeah, so even when I did push them, I think they knew um, it was from a place of wanting the best for the film and wanting them to be the best they could be. It was never out of malice or, 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 or anything like that. It was just, we're all here. Let's do the best we can. I know that for, for uh, war movies, uh, frequently actors will be sent to a boot camp to learn how to be a soldier. Was there any kind of uh, Paleolithic camp? Go learn how to be a Stone Age man? Yes, but as is the nature of the time, it was all on Zoom. Um, so certainly um, Daniel Anderson, who invented the language, Tola, he did one-on-one -on -one sessions with each of the cast so that they had a basic level of pronunciation of key phrases um, or words. And because that was important, you know, they need to look like a tribe, but they need to sound like a tribe. Um, so that was part of it. And then um, Rob Dennis, who was our Paleolithic expert, he was on hand to talk not only to the cast, but also to any of the heads of department, um, you know, and, and point us in the direction of certain dig sites where, oh, you know, in Sun Gear, um, there was a man discovered who wore beads. Uh, that might be interesting. Or, oh, and, and, you know, somewhere in France, we found these um, these bone discs that have that, have that sort of zoetrope um, wow. pattern that's used in the film. So, you know, yeah, it was it was all done remotely, but yeah, it was a kind of kind of a boot camp. And even just um, there was a scene at one point where um, they had to gut a hair. Um, they caught a hare and gutted it, but we cut it because we wanted them to be starving. We thought if we show them eating a meal, it somehow diminishes the tension. But Safia had to learn how to gut a hare, and they, you know, they had to learn how to sharpen tools, how to fire, um, how to put little um, leva um, put little flint shrapnel into their spears to make them sharper. You know, little all these little cool things that you don't have time necessarily to show in the story. But yeah, all those little details that we picked up in the research, they were all told how to do that. Yeah. Well, what was your first time seeing it played in, in front of an audience and how did that go? We, um, the first time with the finished movie, um, it was the London Film Festival. It was our premiere um, and we'd sold out the, the three nights that we were programmed. And, and, you know, the first night's a lot of friends and family. Um, so it's, it's quite a biased crowd. But certainly the, the 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 lady I was sitting next to, I think it might be one of the writer's friends, she jumped in the, in the right places. So I thought, okay, we've got that bit down. Um, and then, you know, then, and afterwards people come up and say, I didn't expect it to be so moving in the end. And that was also incredibly gratifying because I did want it to be moving. I did want it to be a tragedy. Um, the message we're giving is, that in spite of our failure, in spite of our repeated mistakes, we can maybe try and be better at this, you know, at, at being residents on this planet and how we treat each other. So, um, no, that was that was great. You know, it's a thrill. I mean, it's, to see your movie on a big screen is just, it's the reason we all went to the cinema, right? To feel the power of that image. Um, and also, you know, the fact that the movie starts with... Um, a group of people around a flickering light telling a story to then, you know, have that projected on a cinema screen. That's, that, that's really cool. That's really special. I really felt that what, what, and seeing it, like, seeing that in the theater, I really felt surprisingly, maybe it's because I'm a filmmaker. I would, I think in that yeah. way, but I remember thinking like, this is a perfect place to start this story. Around right. a fire being told a story in a movie theater, mm -hmm. looking at the light and, 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 and and speaking of the power, there's the power of the image, which and this film is beautiful. But I also want to talk about the music, which on the on a big mm -hmm. sound system, really got down to something bone deep in me. Could you talk a little bit about the composer and how you came up with those? Yeah, sounds. Yeah, so Adam Yanota Bajowski, um, he'd he'd scored Saint Maud, so and all so Oliver recommended him, and so did Rose actually, and um, so I met him having really liked the work he'd done in that film. 
And I said, I've got, I said, I'm not going to tell you what instruments to use. Okay. I'm not going to tell you how to score. All I care about is what I feel when I watch the movie with your music on it. But I said, the, the main thing I'd like you to try in the first instance is find instruments from that time period. And you can do what you like to them. I don't care if you put them through filters or do some shit in Pro Tools to, you know, change the pitch or whatever. But just try and do your research, find the instruments from that period or as close to that period as we can and try and build your score around that. And I think 90% of the score is conch shells, kudu horns, skin drums. Um, he, there's a, a bone flute expert in Australia, I think, and he, he recorded a bunch of sounds that Adam put in a sampler and he was changing the pitch and undulation and things. And yeah, so that that's the reason um, that that really is why the score to me sounds so unique is because it's entirely created, almost entirely created with instruments from that time period, lithophones, you know, like a stone xylophone, etc. cetera. So, um, and the other thing I said to him, because we were watching the film in an edit suite with quite small speakers. I said, I, I need to feel this in my bones, you know? And he said, oh, don't worry. He said, I'm using frequencies that when you play this in a cinema, it'll make your spine melt. And I was like, great, okay, I'm in. Um, so, so yeah, it was, it's, it was about, it's about the score. It's about the landscape. It's about these characters. It's all of it has to like seep into your pores and then beat you around the head. So um, that was, that was, uh, that that was my that was my note to him, and he he executed that to a T. Yeah, that sound is the menace of what you described earlier of not knowing what's over the horizon or what's down in the trees down in mm -hmm. the valley. It's this unspecified menace that is just uh, the darkness, and it's uh, it was mm -hmm. perfect. Um, I kind of want to get your speculation on because Anson and I talked about this in our last uh, drop. Uh, why do you believe, I'm sure there's lots of theories on this, and to some degree it's well established, but I'd kind of get to get your thoughts on why it was that Homo sapiens won. What what did we have that... That's, in, that's an interesting one. I mean, obviously, some of some of the Neanderthals ended up in us, right? We did, we did... Um, we did mink we did you know have um relations so you know that that's some of some of them has been subsumed into us but i think it's probably it's probably um you know territory probably has a lot to do with it um i think as well i've you know i've read research that the andertals had a body type that was better over shorter distances much more powerful over shorter distances whereas we had more range um, and could travel further because of our builds compared to their builds. Um, I don't think it was about intelligence. Um, I, you know, I think Neanderthals, you know, brain cavities are 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 big. Um, and in fact, even early modern humans' brains were bigger than our brains now. So clearly, these people were intelligent and were using their brains in in, in different ways, holding probably retaining a lot more information, right? Because you can't Google it. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's tricky because, I mean, we don't know for sure, but it might have been down to technology. Um, it might have been down to surviving colder climates, um, more with more, more adept at that. But also, there was another interesting book that I read, um, by Yuval Noah Harari called *Sapiens*, and it's like a brief history of humankind. It's you've probably read it. It's a great book. And you know that that the idea of myth and of storytelling and how that connects us. And I wonder if maybe, um, you know, you know how the 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 winner gets to write history. Yeah, they get. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if maybe just our ability to to work in groups was was better than Neanderthals and our ability to um, not only to work as well in a group, but then to work well with other groups out with our group. And you know, maybe trading and and such like maybe that was stronger. So we were able to work together more. Um, or maybe you know we just maybe we just snuck up on them in the middle of the night and wiped them out. I mean, you know, it's um, it's, it could be all of the above and none at all. But it's certainly, um, yeah, I, I think there's there's a lot of stuff in there and probably a lot more um, than I know. But certainly from the research I did, that seems like a lot of them. Um, You'd be happy to know that in our first episode about this movie, 
I referenced the same book and had the same argument. <laughs> right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. No. Well, it's. I mean, it's great. It's. It's a fantastic book. Um, and it's yeah, especially those first few chapters. He, he just so succinctly kind of covers that period, and yeah, um, that that book was a big touchstone for us. Maybe not creatively, but just sort of again thematically, it was a it was a huge um, light bulb for 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 us when we read it. I find myself wondering because you know when I saw when I saw this, uh, I, I had heard nothing of it. Uh, yeah. I opened up the listings, and because everything else looked so terrible. Uh, I was out of darkness. What is this? And I saw there was one show time and I thought, well, right. this is interesting. Somebody obviously this is an independent film. Somebody believes in. So that's what made me go, go see it. That in the description of it. Um, and how do you, you know, the question of how do you make a horror set at a time when death was an everyday possibility. But, well, um, I found myself wondering like, how, how is the rollout going? I mean, obviously I'm sure you have a distribution deal in the United States and I'm sure it's different in Europe, but how's it all, how's it all going? Because clearly there's a, there's a, there's a hope here for a build. And I'm just wondering how you guys are, are, uh, how's that looking? I mean, I think, um, th this film has had a really, this is, we've always joked, this is the little film that could, because, um, when the film came out, um, when we played London, then we played a great genre festival in Spain called Sitges, um, and we played a few festivals in the UK, and then we did Fantastic Fest in Austin, and it's just, and we, so it's been slowly building, slowly building. We didn't have the big splash at Sundance or Toronto or Cannes, although we got very close to getting into all of these festivals. Um, we um, we've, we've just slowly built up our the word of mouth over time. So when Bleecker Street came on board to distribute in the US and said they would do a theatrical run, I thought, oh God, I mean, I could retire. Like I'm, this'll do. If I can, my debut movie is going to play in theatres. Uh, that's all you want. And especially in, in this day and age with streaming. Um, and I think originally it was modest. You know, we thought maybe we'll do 200 screens post, you know, in the coasts. And then when we got the news, I think in the end we played 900 screens almost in the States. And, you know, like June part two is going to roll in in a couple of days and like, you know, squash all the competition. And I'm all for that. I can't wait to see that movie. Um, but for us, for this tiny little movie from the UK in a made up language with no, you know, recognized stars, um, you know, we made the movie for, I think, 2.5 million, something like that, to, to do... To, to achieve a rollout in 900 theatres um, in the States is kind of unheard of. Um, and, you know, you know, you can go on Box Office Mojo and check our gross. I mean, it's not, it's not huge numbers, but again, for a small British debut, I think it's the best British debut uh, for seven years in terms of opening weekends. Um, and, you know, again, it's, we're not talking huge money here. Um, you know, I, I can't retire, but... Um, it's, but it's just really gratifying that you can make your crazy little movie and if you just do it with some sincerity and find the right people to back you and support you and see the, the potential that you can, you can, you can make a splash. And even if it is just that one, that one screen and that, you know, that one slot in the day that it's on and, you know, you went to see it and it obviously had an impact on you and I'm eternally grateful for that and, it's it's the best. So yeah, so sorry, I'm slightly rambling, but my think my point is, I think our momentum now in the US is probably going to be you know the juggernaut of June, the sandworm of June is going to crush us. Um, but we opened in the UK last Friday, and that's great. And Sony Worldwide have worldwide rights to other territories, and I guess they'll they'll have strategies for those countries, and we'll find out about that in due course. But yeah, the hope is now that it travels and. All we have to do is change the subtitles, right? And it's ready to go for every other territory in the world. So um yeah, I'm 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 really I'm really excited to see where it goes next. And obviously home entertainment will, will come around. So yeah, there'll be there'll be lots of opportunities for people to catch this this crazy little movie. That's true. I didn't think about that. Was it, did you think about that early on, how much money you would save having to dub people into other languages? This very, I mean, you know, very shrewd of you. Very shrewd yeah. to think that far ahead. I know. I, I, I wish I could say I, I thought that far ahead, but really, it was just about it's got to be in a made-up language, just so that I believe it. 
never mind, you know, the, the good people of Germany or, you know, South Korea. Um, yeah, but I guess it's, you know, it certainly is a very, um, it certainly cuts a few corners, shall we say. <laughs> Well, it was not at the time, not at the time, but <laughs> down the line, yeah, it definitely seems a few pennies. <laughs> well, it was it, just to echo Anson. It was a um, uh, such a it was a real breath of fresh air to go to the cinema and, and see something like this. That was, and it did remind me a little bit of uh, The Witch. It, it it did have that like this is a time machine. I have gone back. This is not. Oh, uh, a dramatized uh, version of people speaking English and usually with some sort of accent that you would think is a, <laughs> instead of speaking a, a new language they just throw a weird accent onto it and so the commitment that I felt all the way through it was just 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 wonderful and it help it always seeing something like this always restores my faith a little bit in, in cinema it's not all just going to be you know I'm not trying to bag on comic book movies, but I think we've. Well, but there's enough of yeah. them. I think we've had enough of them. Yeah, I mean the, the way I see, it, I like I like hamburgers, but just not right. every night of the week. Precisely. You know? Exactly. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much for taking your time to be with us, man. I really, really do appreciate it. And, and I appreciate you guys just seeing the movie and and championing it from your end. It's really, really. I feel just very uh, thankful. Thank. Yeah. So again, thank you so much for having me. It's been a, a real pleasure. Thank you. I noticed some of the feedback that we got some from our post. I, th I can, I think we can uh, take credit for at least, at least five more people that went out <laughs> to the theater great. to see it. <laughs> great, yeah, absolutely great. No, I, and I hope those five people enjoyed it too. Well, they did. No, I, I appreciate that immensely, immensely. Thank you. Oh, oh that's another. Qu I had, sorry, I had one more question. So, so I know you're scouting your your television show right now. Um, but, but do you know what your next movie is going to be? I don't. I've 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 written something that I'm sort of I'm calling a sports noir. There you go, new genre. Um, and uh, and it's yes, yeah, it's, it's sort of a, a, an update of um, one of my favorite movies, The Sweet Smell of Success. Um, Tony Curtis, Burt Lancaster movie, directed by another Scott Alexander McKendrick. Um, uh, so yeah, it's a sort of uh, a re not reimagining. It's just a that's the, the 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 rough comp, but it's set in a very different time period, and yeah, it's it's a little bit different. And um and I've got other things in the fire, but far too early to say. Um, other than I I I I, I want to try all the genres. I want to try a bit of sci-fi, a thriller, action, another horror if a good one comes along. Yeah, I just um yeah, I just want to try and fit it all in before before they retire me before the phone stops ringing <laughs> it's great man. well good luck good luck with it man I, I, and to, to all your endeavors going forward i can't wait to see more yeah you're off to a banger start man thank you so much guys i appreciate it thank you the well is produced recorded and edited by brandon edgens and anson mount Theme music for The Well was composed by Jonathan Myberg and performed by Brandon Edgens. Additional music for this episode by Brandon Edgens. Thank you for listening and have a great week.